Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. Alabama has a strong history of aviation. Starting soon after the Wright brothers first powered flight on December 17, 1903. In 1910, the brothers opened a flight school in an old cotton plantation outside of Montgomery, Alabama. The operation was short lived, but the area was used as an airplane depot during World War I and then became Maxwell Field. Maxwell Field, now known as Maxwell Air Force Base, was named in honor of William Calvin Maxwell, born in Natchez, Alabama. He was an ROTC student attending the University of Alabama when the U.S. entered World War I. He dropped out and joined the Army. He was stationed in the Philippines after the war when he died trying to land his plane. His commander lobbied the Army to name the field in his honor. We've heard stories about the heroics of the Tuskegee Airmen, and we've heard about many other pilots and astronauts with Alabama roots. Still, I want to focus more on women aviators from Alabama in this episode of the Alabama Short Stories podcast. There is Katherine Stinson, who was born in Fort Payne, Alabama. She became the fourth woman to earn the FAI pilot certificate. The FAI is the world governing body for air sports. Stinson was the first female pilot to fly a loop, the first female to fly for the U.S. Mail Service, and the first female to fly in Canada and Japan. Mildred Hemmons Carter was born in Benson, Alabama, and was one of the first women to earn her pilot's license as part of the Civilian Pilot Training Program. Her license also gave her the distinction of being the first African-American female pilot in Alabama. She was attending Tuskegee University, and she worked in an office that processed applications for the training program. She applied herself, only to be rejected because she was not yet 18 years old. She applied the following year again and was accepted. Mildred met and married Herbert Carter, who was at Tuskegee training to be a pilot, one of the Tuskegee Airmen. She applied to be part of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, the WASPs, but was turned down because of her race. She became a member of the Civil Air Patrol in Alabama, but was denied the opportunity to patrol the state due to her race. In 2011, Carter was declared an official member of the Women Air Force Service Pilots and a designated original Tuskegee Airman. One woman who did become a member of the WASPs was Nancy Batson Cruz. She earned her private pilot's license and her commercial pilot's license in 1940. In the spring of 1942, she made her instructor's rating, and that fall was one of the first women to be accepted for the Experimental Women's Auxiliary Fairing Squadron, also known as the WAFs. The WAFs, an awkward acronym, would become the WASPs the following year. Nancy Batson, as she was known during the war years, became the first Alabama woman to fly military aircraft. Alabama natives Jan Davis, Catherine Thornton, Kay Heyer, and Mae Jemison all became astronauts, traveling to space on the space shuttle. Mae Jemison was the first African-American woman to fly into space. And then there is Ruth Elder. Ruth Elder was born on September 8, 1902 in Anniston, Alabama, one of six children of James and Sarah Elder. She entered a short-lived marriage when she was 20 years old. She divorced and then married Lyle Womack when she was 22. I'm not sure how and when the two would have met. Lyle grew up in the Panama Canal Zone and attended Iowa State University. But no matter how, they married in Birmingham and eventually moved to Lakeland, Florida, where Elder would find work as a dental assistant. Womack's business would have him travel back and forth from Panama. One day at work, Elder was looking out the window and she noticed a plane fly past and land in the field across from her office. The man flying that plane was George Haldeman, who had caught the aviation bug a decade earlier and become an instructor. Ruth Elder soon became a student. The 1920s was when pilots wanted to become known for firsts. The first to fly across the country, the first to fly in winter, that sort of first. But no first was more desired than New York to Paris. Charles Lindbergh was an obscure U.S. airmail pilot when he decided to try for the Ortega Prize. A $25,000 reward was offered to the first aviator to fly nonstop from New York City to Paris or the other way around. He completed the feat on May 21, 1927 and became world famous overnight. 
Now, as sure as Elder knew that she wanted to fly, she also wanted to become the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. Investors were found in Wheeling, West Virginia, who saw an excellent opportunity to cash in on the female Lindbergh. They purchased a Stinson SM-1 Detroiter, a plane capable of an Atlantic crossing and with many similarities to Lindbergh's Ryan NYP. It was named the American Girl, and the name was emblazoned in script on the side of the plane so everyone could see. Elder was given a choice of pilots to fly with her, but Ruth chose George Haldeman, her instructor and friend who she had the most faith in. Her husband had been supportive of her flying, but crossing the Atlantic in a plane bothered him greatly, not only because he cared about his wife, but his manliness was being called into question. He thought he had talked Elder out of the flight when he set off for a short trip to the Panama Canal. Elder had other plans. Elder and Haldeman traveled to New York to start their trip across the Atlantic. They made a stop in Wheeling, West Virginia to thank their investors. Elder was swarmed by the press and fans when they got to Roosevelt Field in New York, all wanting to see the female Lindbergh. Elder took to the attention and admiration as if she was born to it. If you follow any stories about adventurers, you would know that attempting records in the winter is always a bad idea, especially when it is attempted in the North Atlantic. Winter was fast approaching, but Elder and Haldeman ignored the potential for bad weather. They couldn't wait until spring. Several other women were planning flights, and Elder had to be first. Lindbergh's route was north along the coasts of Maine, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland before crossing the Atlantic. The American girl would fly south of that route. This route would keep them out of the worst weather and closer to shipping lanes. American girl lifted off in poor weather on October 11, 1927, and within hours they ran into heavy storms and would fight them for the rest of the trip. Haldeman had to dump gasoline to keep the plane in the air at one point in the flight. They had been in the air for 28 hours when the engine started leaking oil. It took Lindbergh 21 hours and 40 minutes to get to Paris, so Elder assumed she could make it in the same amount of time. The French press knew when she was leaving, and they didn't expect her to make it in that time, but by October 13th, they wanted to know what happened to the American girl and its female pilot. Concern for her and her co-pilot George Haldeman was splashed across newspaper headlines. The oil leak couldn't be fixed in flight, so Haldeman asked Elder to start looking for ships. They were going to have to ditch the plane. Within a few hours, she saw the Dutch oil taker, Berendrecht. They flew over and got the attention of the ship's captain before Handelman brought the plane down for a water landing as close as they could to the ship. They climbed out on the wing and waited to be rescued by the lifeboat, and just in time. Soon after they were aboard the Berendrecht, the American girl exploded and sank. The ship set course for the Azores Islands to drop them off. They eventually made it to France, but this time by boat and military plane. Ruth's family had been nervously waiting in Anniston, Alabama for any news about the flight. They had been waiting at a newspaper office, wondering what had happened. They realized that their daughter should be in Paris already, and no one had heard anything. Their anxiety was crushing. Her mother sobbed with joy when word finally made it to Anniston that she was safe. I knew Ruth would be found, her mother exclaimed. Her husband wiped away the tears as the rest of the family's fear turned to happiness. Even though the flight ended short of its goal, the pilots were treated as heroes in France. They made it back to New York City on November 11th and were given a ticker tape parade. Our pilots then attended a luncheon hosted by Calvin Coolidge at the White House. Anniston Mayor Sidney Reeves declared December 20th, 1927, Ruth Elder Day. Alabama Governor Bib Graves enthusiastically endorsed the celebration. He and his entire staff attended. He also ordered the 40-piece National Guard Band of Gadsden to attend, along with the pursuit planes of the 108th Observational Corps from Birmingham. Publicly, Lyle Womack supported his wife and her adventure, but he did not take it well being in the background. He especially bristled at being called Mr. Elder or Mr. Ruth Elder by the press and fans. There would be many opportunities for Ruth Elder following her flight. The admiration, opportunities, and being away from home took their toll on her marriage. Now, while I suspect the marriage may have been on shaky grounds before the flight, 
It was too much for La Womack's fragile male ego, and he wanted out of the marriage. According to Womack, one of the reasons he demanded a divorce was because she would not stay home. Also, her failure to kiss him upon returning from her ill-fated flight was cited as cause of embarrassment. About his divorce, he said, Ruth chose a career rather than be a housewife, and I have no other course. The marriage was dissolved just before Womack traveled as a member of Commander Richard E. Byrd's 1929 expedition to the South Pole. Womack would be an explorer, a lion tamer, and meet his untimely demise when he was kicked by a pet donkey later in life. The year after Elder's failed attempt, Amelia Earhart became the first woman to cross the Atlantic by plane as part of a crew. She kept the flight log. And on May 20, 1932, five years to the day of Lindbergh's flight, Earhart would become the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, Elder might not have become the first woman to fly from New York to Paris, but at that time, it was the longest flight ever made by a woman, and they established a new overwater endurance flight record of 2,623 miles. Ruth Elder was cashing in on her newfound fame, and she moved to Hollywood. She became an actress and appeared in the silent movies Moran of the Marines in 1928, The Wing and Horseman in 1925, and Fashion News in 1930. Her movie career was over by then, but she continued to fly and participate in air races. Elder had fame and fortune, but she could not hold on to either. She would tell reporters, The money slipped through my fingers. She was in a rough place in 1955 when she met Howard Hughes. He was an aviator himself, and he had known about Elder in her early flying days. There was also a rumored romance between the two. Knowing she needed work, he suggested she apply for a position as a secretary at Hughes Aircraft. He wrote, YWH for you will hire at the top, ensuring she would get the job. Elder would continue to be interviewed over the years, and the Associated Press did a story about her at Hughes Aircraft. She is quoted as saying, I just love being a working girl. The accompanying photo of her at her desk seems to say otherwise. Ruth Elder would be married six times. Husband Ralph King would be numbers four and six. They'd be together until her death on October 9, 1977, two days shy of the 50th anniversary of her flight. I am proud to announce that the book Alabama Short Stories Volume 1 is now available at Amazon.com. It features the first three season stories of the podcast in book form. It's a perfect gift for that friend or family member who just doesn't want to listen to a podcast. It's also great for podcast fans who want pictures with their stories. And it's a perfect gift for that hard to buy person in your life. You know who they are. Now get them the book. It's available as paperback, hardback, or Kindle version. Not only will it make your life better, but it will help us to continue to produce this podcast. It's a win-win. You can find a link at alabamashortstories.com or search Alabama Short Stories on amazon.com. Order yours today.